just talking about anything with me. You're listening to Comic Reflections, episode 28. I'm Nicholas Prom. And I'm Jeff Barnhart. Jeff's feeling a little under the weather today, so we're just going to try and make do. Uh, so yesterday, Jeff, I was invited. I got to go to uh, Wizard World uh, Comic Con uh, in, in Portland. And I got to see that Stan Lee exists in the world. I wasn't going to wait on mm-hmm. line all day to maybe meet mm-hmm. him, but then there was lots of famous TV folks from um, The Walking Dead and uh, mm-hmm. and uh, Henry Winkler from uh, Happy Days was there. Lou Ferrigno Why? was there. Why not? Happy Days had a comic book. I did not know this. Yes, I'm uh, sure Mark did, but uh, <laughs> I mean. Come on, Welcome Back, Cotter had a comic book too. Oh, yeah. So, um, but you know, some of these things, it's kind of like tangential, uh, you know, like whatever. There'll be celebrity folks that do appearances at these things. Um, but uh, did you get fanboy eyes? Or I mean, when I've seen people who are somewhat famous and says, "Oh, that's cool," but I met the Ramones and I was like giddy like a little. Were you girl. at the Ramones? Yeah, well, I would be too. That's yeah, amazing. Yeah, I you know I just I signed my CD and that's about it. Yeah, but, uh, and I was gonna talk to them, but I decided not to. They look pretty grumpy. <laughs> so, well, yeah, they were in Raleigh, so sure, that. Raleigh, North Carolina. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, I'd be grumpy too. <laughs> no, it's not that bad. I'm just kidding. Come on. No, yeah. But but uh, did I get all like nerdy, hyperventilating right. fanboy? No. But I saw some famous people. Got to say hello. So a couple of you know uh, TV movie folks I caught and said hi as they were like leaving the men's room. Like oh hello, you know. Yeah, okay. <laughs> but um, um, no, I, I didn't do that. I did. Um, I got to meet. Um, Kurt Busiek, who's one of my favorite comic book writers, he's written, well, his own creation, Astro City, which is really great. Okay. And uh, he's written, he did Avengers for like four years. Mm-hmm. He's done Conan, Superman. He's a really great writer. And I got to meet him. He's a really uh, humble, really nice person. So that was cool, too. Um, and I met uh, Chris Claremont, who wrote X-Men from like 1975 to 1991. Wow. And... Um, I I asked him to just you know how would he describe his working relationships with Dave Cockrum kind of compared with John Byrne these were guys who were mm-hmm. you know artists on the book and he, in the most diplomatic way he basically said that John Byrne was a humorless dick wow. <laughs> which is true I mean the guy has I mean I knew it was a loaded question I mean he John Byrne is famous you know prima donna and mm-hmm. has bad mouth claremont in the press and stuff so i kind of knew what I, where i was going but he he didn't really he he was kind of like he was a gentleman about it but, as yeah. best he could you could tell he was a little a little irked by the mm-hmm. question but he said that dave cockrum what you know who, the late dave cockrum uh who who was from uh he was from oregon i can't remember like pendleton or someplace mm-hmm. like that but um uh he said that Dave brought uh, uh, had more of a sense of humor and you know personality um, that he brought to the book that he liked you know so that was that was interesting hmm. um, and uh, I wore my uh, my Captain Marvel costume and so Excellent. I had uh, I probably at least a hundred people stop and ask for photos with me or take my picture wow. or whatever and that was cool and fun and and I actually got interviewed for a, a, a TV show that's going to be on the Sci-Fi Channel uh, coming out. That's all about cosplay. Uh-huh. So I'm not sure what it's called. Chloe Dykstra is the host, and um, she's kind of a TV personality. Um, she, um, I take your word for it. I've never heard of her. But well, it's okay. Um, uh, I've only seen her on a couple things myself. So, yeah. but um, she was very cool, and so I guess I'm gonna be on that show. If I don't, okay. unless I end up on the cutting room floor, I don't know. But but that was cool. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and met some some independent creators uh, of comics and stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, there was a couple of people that I wanted to meet and say hello that I just didn't get a chance to. Um, Mike Grell, who was famously artist on uh, Green Arrow and uh, the Warlord for uh-huh. for DC, he was there. Um, uh, Michael Golden, who was uh, he was really well known for uh, working on the Micronauts. 
and mm-hmm. he's the co-creator of. That was uh, an interesting little comic book, the Micronauts. So sure, it was. Yeah, it was pretty cool. Yeah, you know, uh, and he illustrated one of my favorite X-Men stories ever too. It was a, a thing in uh, that appeared in Marvel fanfare. It was like the X-Men and Spider-Man uh, in the Savage Land, and it was really cool. And they fought Sauron and stuff, and the Angel was there, and it was it was cool. And they met Kazar and all that. It's a good story. Okay. Um, and uh, and he also was the co-creator of Bucky O'Hare, which was an independent comic, and that became an animated series in the early '90s. I wanted to meet him, but didn't. Uh, it didn't fit into the schedule that day. So, but mm-hmm. um, but over all in all, Comic Con was really loads of fun. That was a crowd. Oh, it was great, and um, lots of really uh, great costumes. Um, mm-hmm. I, there was in guy in this incredibly great Galactus costume that was so uh, well made and it was just really, really impressive. Huh. Um, that's some, okay. I had never seen a Galactus costume. It, was, it is one of the greatest villains. Though. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you can even call him a villain, he's almost a force of nature. But, but yeah, I mean, as an adversary for the Fantastic Four, he's so iconic and that was, yeah, really, uh, the probably the best costume I've ever seen. It was really great, and there was lots of stuff. There was a, some people that came as red shirts from Star Trek, uh-huh. but they were like dead, like zombified oh, with makeup well. and stuff, and that was funny. Um, some cool group costumes and things like that. So that was fun. I wore a red uh, red shirt to a yeah, some kind of outdoor show, and. Um... I got about five people come to me and say, hey, Richard, and all this stuff. And it was just, <laughs> wow, the, the power of just wearing this simple t-shirt I got at New York City. <laughs> so, but, but, um, that's cool. Um, were you embarrassed by the fans? Sometimes if I'm into something and people take it too far, oh, I'm embarrassed that I like the same stuff as these people too. <laughs> but, uh, um, you know, you're going to encounter some people whose social skills aren't the best. Mm-hmm. Um, I met somebody who was just gushing. They were just they had to get a photo with me because they loved Captain Marvel so much. Mm-hmm. You know, I guess I had a guy who had saw me and like a good, had like from like across the hall and was like trying to get, catch up with me all day to get mm-hmm. a photo and he caught me, uh, you know, later in the lobby. You know, so so there there were a couple people, but you know, it's okay. I wouldn't. You know, I was there to have fun, and I I went in costume knowing full well that photos would ensue. All right. So that was fine. I, I didn't mind at all. Mm-hmm. Um, I think comic book. I, mean, I think nerds are way put upon. I don't think I've never been worried. Oh my gosh, am I might if I go into this alleyway, there's a nerd might attack me. <laughs> I'm, I'm just not worried about nerds, and um, being kind of a nerd and all that in some ways. None of them very useful, unfortunately. I'm not a computer nerd, <laughs> well. but um, I'm just nerdy and far. Um, it's less okay. Practical stuff, but um, why? You know, the, everyone likes to pick on them, and it's really is isn't there worse things in the world to worry about than nerds and someone reading a comic book or watching Star Trek? And they're just a safe target, and nerds I, usually I take guess. it fairly well. But I uh, mean. It's never bothered me. I mean, well, I mean, I embraced the nerd thing pretty early on. I was mm-hmm. like, whatever. It's, it's. There's almost like a chic to it now. I mean, like if yeah. you, uh, you know, except for like the guys who are like the socially awkward guys, then they are just yeah. those guys are like they're kind of like oh man nerd. But um, you know, if you're a fairly normal person and you just like all this you know stuff, whatever. Yeah. It's not a a big deal. Mm-hmm. So. And it's cool. I think those people who are like a little on the edge, they get to be included in something that's a little bigger, and mm-hmm. and, and that's cool. You know, you get to be into something that where you have a greater level of acceptance. I think that's that's healthy. Mm-hmm. So I get, I do get annoyed uh, when you go to, to Artist Sally at a comic con, and there will be the guy who f- goes to the comic writer or artist and flops down a, a, a stack of comics to be signed in front of them. And doesn't say a word and has like just a pile and I think that's just crappy it's just like you know fine bring a book and get signed but like say hi thank them for their work you know ask them a question you know yeah. do something that kind of engages them rather than just like 
here's my books I'm going to turn around and put on eBay tomorrow. Right. Well, that's yeah. not a nerd. That's uh, someone making money. In, uh, yeah. In, in a crass way. So. Yeah, it's, it's very crass. And um, mm. I, I think it cheapens what we do. When I met Kurt Busiek, I mean, I didn't get anything signed. I'm not an autograph hound. Mm. But I just, I made sure, I told him, I was like, you're one of my favorite artists. Or excuse me, I said, I told him, you're one of my favorite writers in comics. And I just want to thank you for all of your work. And he was like, really, he was like, really, like, taken aback and touched by it. I'm like, oh, man. He was a really neat guy. Cool. He's like, thank you. You know, that's really nice. So, yeah. I think they don't get enough of that. Yeah, they don't get enough pay either. From what I'm saying. It's well, like, yeah, but I mean, at least they used not to. That's I don't know. I think I think it. certain people get you know they they make a living and that's cool. Yeah. So, but yeah, so that was Comic Con, and okay. and that was really a load of fun. I didn't feel up to it this year. But yeah. Is it well, a, this was my is first. It an um, this is the first time. This is Wizard World. This kind of like this traveling convention. This is the yeah. first time it's been in Portland. Mm -hmm. But um, I'll I'll go again. I mean, Portland has its own conventions yeah. throughout the year, and this is the first one that I've been into in a long years and years. Uh, but I'm I had so much fun. I'm definitely want to make sure that I go to, you know, the ones we have in Portland. We have Stump Town and Rose City Comic Con, mm -hmm. and I think there's one or two others actually, as well. So, so yeah. It was great. Um, so today, the other part of the show, we want to talk about some uh, some super villain hero kind of dynamic mm -hmm. and archetype stuff. Yeah. Um, you're talking about in the Silver Age. A lot of times Superman mainly would, would fight these uh, crooks, regular old crooks, and only... Certain you know, instances, he would fight. He would fight uh, um, Brainiac and Lex Luthor, and I was thinking that that maybe without so many um, super villains, it made it more interesting um, when they did finally come on. They weren't overused. Well, that yeah. definitely makes sense because it's a, it's a big deal when Brainiac shows up, or the Luthor stories tend to be very well remembered and like oh man that was great you know uh i love superman and like and and, and lex luther and the dynamic there and i feel like because superman represents like the complete the american ideal the myth of america and um that that this morality and that fortitude um and luther is kind of like the Nietzschean Superman, like my, you know, the, the will to power kind mm -hmm. of like, okay, I am awesome. And, and my ego says, you know, I've got to be the greatest. And I, you know, will just by whatever means necessary, you know, accomplish all for my own self. And Superman is like the selfless, you know, uh, guy. Mm -hmm. And I, I love that it's this physical power against this evil intellect and the, right. the, that's why their dynamic is so interesting. It's not two guys slugging each other. Um, it's a game of cat and mouse that I think is so uh, and fascinating. And Superman's that's Superman's pretty smart too. He, he's he's rarely out outwitted, but he you know, if he is, he outwits him at the end. Well, right. And uh, it is interesting that the, his two biggest villains are super intelligent. And that's their only superpower is high intelligence. Sure. They're not, you know, super strength or super flight or, or super sense of humor. <laughs> <laughs> but they, uh, the, and, that's, and um, I guess the only way to really defeat Superman is out thinking, but it's hard to do. Right. Um, you know, it's, you've got to put him in a, you've got to find ways to trap him into you know, he's got to deal with this problem while you're doing something over here. Mm -hmm. um, anything to slow him down or whatever. So, right. so it, it, it's cleverness that's got to come into play. And yeah. um, and I like cleverness. I think that's one of the greatest attributes of any artist, something clever. Yeah. Something, oh, wow, what a great idea. You know, yeah. Um, it's, it goes for movies and comic books, something that just makes you stand up. Wow, that's great. And cleverness is rarely done. People try to think they're clever, and but normally clever in movies and all that is something that wouldn't outwit a five-year-old. But 
Brainiac, and they can get clever. And, and Brainiac and uh, and Lex Luthor, yeah, they are evil geniuses, and some of their ideas are pretty cool. Yeah. Um, um, let's see. We mentioned Galactica. Galactus. 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 Yeah. And uh, he, uh, it's not a. Not a villain, but an adversary, and that's yeah. an interesting. That you don't get that much in comic books. There are villains and heroes. Yeah, um, they're just not adversaries. Anymore. Right. I mean, Galactus so. is this force of nature, and it's like, okay, he must be dealt with. Mm -hmm. How do we repel the the devourer of worlds? And I think that was one of the things that made the Fantastic Four such a different kind of comic book. Um, you hear you have this group of heroes who don't have secret identities. Mm -hmm. they're public figures and they fight all the time like in fight mm -hmm. and they have to rely on you know the genius of Reed more than their superpowers I think to defeat um, uh, you know their their enemies um, yeah um, and Galactus he's he doesn't particularly care if it's Earth or whatever. He right, just he must to, feed, yeah. you know, so. And so, he's more of a shark, although people consider sharks evil. They just want to, they're just hungry. Um, right. Um, and it's, but you don't get that much, it's only, you don't get that dynamic in comic books that much. You know, they're always just the enemy. And, uh, well, right. I'm trying to think of. I think there's, there's other instances where, I mean, even within the Fantastic Four, like Doctor Doom is not a, completely evil guy he has this sense of nobility he it's like he wants to conquer the world because he thinks he's the best man for the job so to speak but he would his whole thing is like well he would rather destroy reed richards like and give up that like like if he had a choice between ruling the world and revenge on the fantastic four he would take that so like he would almost give up uh, you know, uh, an opportunity for that just um, to humiliate uh, Reed Richards or, um, uh, you know, I, I like Dr. Doom, the only villain with a country. And, um, it's, you know, I love that. You couldn't send him to jail because he has diplomatic immunity. Which, yeah. That's so, really cool. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, I think if you go to, like, the, the X-Men, for example, like Magneto, who is, like, is he, he's one of those villains that's gone back and forth as good or bad, like 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 Namor the Submariner. Yeah. Um, but and the Hulk. Yeah, that's right, the Hulk, too. Um, but, like, uh, Magneto is, like, he's this villain with a cause, and so it's he does he's not a super villain in the classic sense of I want all the money, I want all the power, I want to rule the world. It's... I want a place for my people, and we should be sitting at the head of the table, not uh, merely accepted, you know, or whatever. I and, mean, no, a reasonable person would disagree with this, <laughs> with, with his aims. <laughs> well, right. And uh, I'm trying to think of a, an example of an adversary instead of a villain or enemy. There's a John Ford movie called Ford Apache, and the, the Apaches are put upon and they're cheated. And um, the the actual villain in the movie, Henry Fonda, mm -hmm. um, attacks him and he gets slaughtered. The Apaches were the adversaries, but they had honor, they had a point of view, and they had right behind their side in, in many ways. And yeah. the way that was treated was very sophisticated, and just not, actually it's, it's rare that's done any time. Well, I think you like another example is, and I think we mentioned it uh, last week was. The movie Tora Tora Tora. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like the Japanese were not these horrible villains. They were attacking in a preemptive thing to defend the empire or something. Mm -hmm. And they were human in that movie. They were not, uh, you know, just cast as villains. And that was interesting. Um, I think that's probably why it's such a great movie. Yeah. Um, um, Those really big epic World War II films, um, the same way. Um, the Longest Day, um, A Bridge Too Far. They um, they show both sides, and that's that's always interesting. You want one side to win, of course. Well, sure. But um, the other side is not totally evil, and that gets yeah. boring. And, right. and shades of gray, and all that. And there's more people, some people more evil than others. And 
um, you don't get, eh, I don't know, I guess Marvel may do that more, uh, especially with the X-Men and all that, um, Magneto does have a point. You know, and then yeah. some of their, their, you know, a lot of the things with X-Men was like they were fighting racism. Right. You know, um, so, you know, the Sentinels were created to inster exterminate mutants, but they weren't like the typical giant robots that were used to like knock over a bank or something like you would see in an, like in an old Superman comic. Luther's got a new robot or something. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah. yeah. Although, okay, say mutants existed and okay. Nita really existed, the Sentinels would probably be the rational idea, which would be a rational thought if these mutants are going around causing trouble and all that stuff, you're going to have to take them out. It's, yeah. Well, but but like, wow. Uh, but I mean, with anything, it's like, if they were created as a police force for this yeah. thing, that would be one thing. But the Sentinels were not... Oh, like, they're assassins, not police force? They were assassins. Okay. They were killing indiscriminately mutants. They were like, if I had technology that they would detect mutant power and okay. hunt down... Not just mutant terrorists like Magneto. <laughs> I was like, my, like, my X Men uh, power was. Weak. <laughs> it, it's all right. It's okay. I, I experienced X Men burnout at some point long ago, yeah. so um, that's all totally okay. Um, but going back, I'm thinking like uh, some of those archetype things, like Captain America to me is very similar uh, to what Superman represents, but in a different kind of way because he's not invulnerable. He's the peak of a human physique and enduring that, you know, because the yeah. super soldiers for him kind of keeps him young. Uh, Intelligent. Yeah. Great leadership. But, but um, his thing was like always. he was always resourceful and he would never give up. Mm -hmm. And, you know, no matter what trap you've, whatever you've got, put against Captain America, he will persevere. And I think I, that's a beautiful symbol for what the American uh, ideal and dream and uh, ethic and all of those things are supposed to be. You know, right. and, and on the other end, you have, you know, the Red Skull, his arch nemesis, who was this enduring, uh, undying evil hmm. who was, there was nothing redeemable about him. He was just uh, despicable and villainous and he had to be the antithesis to Captain America. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I thought they were both portrayed well in the movie. Oh, that, that movie was excellent. I, I really enjoyed that a lot. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. Uh, Red, Red Skull is kind of, I don't know, he's still one dimension. He's, he's, he's okay. He's... Um, he's not one of my favorites. There's not no. much depth to him. I'm a Nazi. I'm a Nazi, and I'm gonna start a Hydra or Cobra. Uh, and Hydra. I, I think. I know the one's a rip off the other. Is, right. is it Hydra? Hydra is kind of. Uh, it was an organization of like in the movie. It was a little different, but Hydra in the comics was this terrorist organization that was started by Baron Strucker, who was another Nazi villain. Right. Right. Um, and so it was. It was kind of like he, what he and the Red Skull shared was wanting to kind of keep the dream of the Third Reich alive and you know start a new Fourth Reich. Captain America had a lot of Nazi villains because you had the Red Skull and Baron Zemo and uh, uh, Baron Blood, a lot of Barons. Yeah. Um, and Baron Strucker, and there was also uh, Arnim Zola, who was the he was the guy, he had his mind transferred into the robot body and his chest like was a screen that had his face and all, like where his neck was, there was like a robot that looked like a, a camera that like, uh, you know, a security camera. It's, Goodness. he's really weird looking, great, great Jack Kirby creation, that, that, that character. But, but yeah, he had at least those as like these Nazi villains that were really cool and interesting. Yeah. Whoa. That's a loud sound. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's probably the, the heat coming on. No, I think that was someone throwing a frisbee that hit the window. Oh. But okay. hey, we can, it's live radio. Okay. <laughs> okay. So we'll move on. Um, it's interesting. Uh, the barons, the names. I was looking at some of the names of the villains, and there was Captain Nazi. And the, oh, from Captain Marvel's villain. Yeah. yeah. Um, there's. Uh, 
Captains, Barons. There's no Duke villains. Or <laughs> Not that I can think of. There's Counts. Counts. Count Vertigo. Count... Uh, now I'm going to blank on this guy, but there's a Count that I know has fought... Uh, Count Dracula, I'm sure. Is well, a bunch Dracula of Mar became a Marvel Comics character, yeah. Um, there's Sergeant um, Fury and Sergeant... Um, Sergeant Rock. Yeah, those are um, good guys. No lieutenants. I can't think of any lieutenant. I mean, their, their name being Lieutenant Ma, you know. Sure. So, and, um, uh, or, Count Nefaria, that's who I was trying to remember. Yeah, he was cool. Yeah. I think Corporal Punishment is a, <laughs> is a um, wrestling... I mean, that's a great name for any parody kind yeah. of thing. Um, there's a few majors. There's Major Disaster and... Uh, uh, um, but yeah, a lot of... Are there any generals? Uh, General Terror? <laughs> well, there was General Zod. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there are, there are some generals. And yeah, a military rank is a good preface to a character name, a hero or villain. Uh, yeah. But yeah... What, Let's uh, see. Let's talk about uh, maybe uh, Batman and the Joker. It's kind of a con really contrasting because they're the antithesis of each other, but in I don't know. It's kind of a strange way because the Joker, I mean, has been said to represent chaos, while Batman is like completely, like, you know, the disciplined, you know, uh, mm -hmm. detective type. And he had all these villains like that were uh, that played on the theme of like, oh, okay, you've got to figure out what I'm up to. You know, there was the Riddler, the Puzzler, you know, Calendar Man, all these guys. Hmm. Um, but the Joker was, he would set these traps, but it was so off the wall, you really had to try and get inside like a crazy person's head like to do this. And that's, I think it's, this is the greater challenge for Batman because it's not like ordered rational thought. Yeah, and it's hard to for a same person to think crazy, and then look, yeah, and uh, for the writer as well as Batman. Right, and then does the, it poses the question: Do you have to be a little bit crazy to put on a costume and go and fight crime? You know. Yeah, and yeah. You have to be crazy to read a comic book about a person. <laughs> <laughs> the good kind of crazy, though. Yeah. Um, one thing that I read that was really interesting that was kind of like saying that I think it was Frank Miller said that like. That Batman was as the whole concept was impossibly gay, like it was really uh, that, and that it's been said that that Batman represents the closet, you know, like the appearance of being straight and you know whatever, and that Joker represented like the scene, like out of the closet, like the crazy flamboyant, uh, you know, the the Liberace at, or Paul Lind as the antithesis to like the Rock Hudson who you didn't know until he was. Huh. You know, um, so that's kind of an interesting commentary I've seen, and and I can I can see that you know, um, especially I mean you read some Golden Age comics and like Batman and Robin sleep in the same bed. I mean I've seen those stories. Yeah, I t this is not we're a homophobic the, we, we, slant. We, we, I'm just looking, saying. Yeah, no, but we're we're looking at it through our hypersexual age, and sure. back then. People slept in beds because they could not afford beds, or and then there was this common and Lincoln slept with a man for years because they couldn't simply afford it to um, to, uh, to buy him more than one bed. And it's I don't know. Too many undergraduate classes can be dangerous. So, <laughs> um, yeah, but all right. I mean, this... I'm not saying it should be ignored, but I, it's. It's looking at it through a lens of our modern times, the yeah. postmodern lens. But the person who brought this up first was our comic book's greatest villain of all. That... Dr. Frederick Wortham. Yes. Yes. And, and you're absolutely right. That is kind of you said that that totally was like the the, the, the boy sidekick was like a, a gay pedophile kind of element. And you're forgetting that this is just to uh, – that character is brought in so the hero's got somebody to talk to. Or right. that this and, is entertainment. And for the little boy, man, I like to be like Robin and go with Batman, and because yeah. I, I really couldn't be Batman, but I could be Robin. Exactly. You know? A kid's got some kind of uh, fantasy involvement in the story. Like, oh man, I could pretend to be Robin and be, in, you know, I'm fight not with. I'm so him. sure that you really need 
I don't think kids care that it's, it's another kid, though. And I think that, that was a mistake on comic book. Oh, we have to have a kid in it for, right. for kids. Like, but kids I can, can get into anything. But I can see being able to identify with it and like, oh, cool. Like, I think that's part of the why, the charm of what made Captain Marvel so popular in the 40s. Here was a, a kid who said a magic word and became right. an adult and a superhero. Yeah. Like, what, what could be the – I mean, what's the, the greater fantasy than that? Mm-hmm. For for a little boy, yeah. so I mean, yeah, I was thinking, well, everybody would love to Hulk out, and I certainly would. But sure, um, but then Hulk had a little um, um, friend boy too. So. Well, Hulk had a, a couple. I mean, there was uh, Rick Jones, mm-hmm. uh, and then later when Rick became, I think during the time when Rick was the sidekick of Captain America, or or of he or he became basically the snapper uh, yeah. car, of, you know, from Justice League for, to the Avengers. He was kind of the Avenger sidekick. Um, he actually became the sidekick of of Captain Marvel from Marvel Comics as well. But during all of that time, I think at some point in the 70s, the Hulk had the, uh, another teen friend, Jim Wilson. I think that was his name. And he was a, a, a black kid and he was, you know, he was, you know, a friend of the Hulks, you know. Mm-hmm. So, um, and a cool character. I liked Jim. Um, I think it was Wilson. But, yeah. Um, so yeah, that's a very good point. So the Jim Wilson, I, I'm normally disappointed with black characters. Well, and I don't know, they just either they try to be too hard to be, you know, or they're either too good or too I, sad. They don't seem like real black people. I, and, well, right. And 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 they, it's hard to do that. It would not be stereotypical or patronizing or condescending and and well, right. it's hard for any artwork to do that and, right. and it's failed miserably lots of times but uh, yeah uh, i think in the 70s when a lot of the uh, black characters started to emerge you're right i think a lot of them were kind of like reflections of the pop culture like john shaft you know or superfly yeah. kinds of characters um you know you had the black panther as a as a positive example who was okay he and black lightning were both like trying to be like Sidney Poitier right. type of characters okay they were both okay black panther was a king but he was a inner city school teacher yeah um, like and that. so was black lightning he, you know he's a, he was the same kind of deal although not a king he was right. just the, the school teacher element but yeah you had bill foster who was black goliath um and he had been like a, a lab assistant to, I think, Tony Stark or Henry mm. – oh, and to Henry Pym because I think that's where he got the giant powers. Right. Um, but, and he, he was a cool character. But yeah, I mean when he became a superhero, not just a, a supporting cast character, uh, yeah, they definitely played up the, the black exploitation element. Um, Luke Cage is totally – you know, Power Man yeah. was totally a black exploitation character. Yeah. Um, but he was cool. Yeah, they can be done well. It's just, it's hard to do, and especially because it's a bunch of white guys drawing. It. And, yeah, and writing it, you know. But I think it's better than nothing. Right. And I think, you know, most of those characters, it's like there were elements of stereotypes, but it were they were more positive than negative. It's here are these black guys who are like heroes. They're making the world, their community, a better place. The Falcon was a character that was not really stereotyped, mm-hmm. you know, um, and he was like side by side with Captain America, yeah. you know. There was a black. He's, he's more of a henchman then, but he's always in the Daredevil, and like he's he's a snitch. Daredevil goes and beats him up and gets his information. And... Oh, I remember that guy. I'm blanking on the name, yeah. but yeah. And. Uh... He was interesting, he, and he got became Stilt Man in one episode. He and, became uh, Stilt Man, or so he had these stilts. So I'm guessing. He, and um, well, I know several people were Stilt Man, but uh, that one I, I didn't. Uh, know. It was just for one. Oh, issue. okay. So okay. Yeah, he got these stilts when he kicked Daredevil's Daredevil's butt, and uh, didn't work out. As well, well, yeah, as I mean, even the real Stilt Man always got his butt kicked by Daredevil. But what a Stiltman's one of those villains that is so ridiculous, but I love seeing him on the comics page because the just the the, the shiny armor and the tall, you know, <laughs> yeah. legged costume. It's just visually he's very striking. 
even though he's not a formidable adversary. No, I could take out still. Well, yeah, he just gets tripped up by stuff all the time. All right. Um, it's he's a very clumsy villain. Um, but yeah, he, he is a lot of fun. That's that's a, where should we go with that? Villains that are just bad, but you really enjoy them anyway. Oh, I should enjoy the penguin, but I do. It's sort of the. Uh... Yeah, he the trick Super umbrellas. Enjoy, yeah, trick. You know, that's yeah, that's so stupid. But but yeah, but it's fun and uh, it is fun. Um, he has a. Um, I've seen him done that well, and he has an interesting backstory being picked on by his his fellow students and yeah. becomes, um, gets revenge and yeah, and he's so absurd. It's just fun. Um, yeah. The Riddler. I don't know if I would like the Riddler if it wasn't for Frank Fortune. I don't think I would either. I don't think anyone would hear or would even know about the Riddler. But well, I think he would be a forgotten villain because it's he's a villain. He's kind of gets crammed into like oh we got to try and include the Riddler every once in a while yeah. just so, to keep him there because he's such a known character. But yeah, he's it's hard to do the Riddler well and interesting yeah. um, because he's just a dated gimmick. Right. Um, other villains. Um... I always it's, had it's Batman's or the most memorable. I think I'm trying to think right. of any Marvel ones I really like. Uh, um, Rhino, you should like him. All he can do is charge. But he's he's but, super uh, strong. I mean, the Rhino fought the Hulk a lot too. Yeah. So, which I thought was cool. He yeah. would kind of throw in with uh, the leader, and uh, I remember one story where the Rhino, the leader, ch was like paralyzed, and so he changed minds with the rhino mm. and so he's the in that physical powerhouse body but this in, super intelligent and he fought the hulk and he um hospitalized jim wilson mm. uh, the hulk's friend um that was a cool story i yeah. liked that one um the rhino i think it's mcfarland um did a uh, spider-man with the scorpion oh and, i love um, the scorpion and he, there's a little story in the front that says uh, they wanted to do the Scorpion versus Spider Man. Scorpion, Miss um, Marvel kicked his butt. But he made a really good episode, and uh, the Scorpion and, and the Rhino makes an entrance, and it's just so extraordinary going through this band. And just one of those instances in comic books that just stand out, and it's just brilliant. And, just, and the. The image is seared into your brain because sure. it's so cool and clever, and this so how it's well done. And it, and um, that was one of them. And I've liked the Rhino ever since. Right on. Uh, I'm not very fond of Todd McFarlane as an artist. I think his uh, his do, his anatomy is just not proportions are not good. Mouth. So it is, his mouth open looks weird. And, yeah. And, and but um, um, I don't know. The stories are pretty cool. So. Well, yeah. No, I think. There was some quality writing going on at that time uh, in the book, so you know, well, it, it, even the best artist, if the if the writing is junk, it's not you can't carry it. Right. Um, it does true with every art. I mean, and you can. And yeah. Everything. It's writing is paramount. Yes, I mean, I, I, I got you got to have good art, but I mean, it, it, if the best art in the world will, will mean nothing if if the writing is is subpar. And I always, I, what I'm interested more in any comic book that I look to read, I'm like, who's writing this? Is this somebody that I've enjoyed their material before? That's, that's. I look for the names on the covers, you know, to see because that's that's a. a, a if I'm not sure about something, that will be a, a, decide, a determining factor for me. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. If you like the uh, X Men villains, um, I'm trying to think. Toad, I don't know. Oh, from Sorry. the Toad was interesting. I mean, the original Brotherhood of Evil Mutants was was pretty pretty wild. I mean, I liked, you know, the Toad was there and it was kind of irritating because he would just clingy on Magneto and he was in love with the Scarlet Witch, and uh, you know. Yeah. But he he was interesting enough to endure for a long time. I liked Mastermind, the guy who was just like he wore his, uh, you know, like. He had his cloak or his, his smoking jacket. And he was always just had a, a a fedora and a cigarette, and he was like, "Oh, here, let me cast some illusions." You know, there's a monster. You know, he he was cool. It, um, well, that's it. Is that the first time that villain group had 
the same um, interactions as the hero groups, you know, with the with fights and jealousies and all that stuff. And that, oh, yeah. what's hallmark of Marvel Comics is oh, yeah. the social interactions within the groups. And, yeah, the, uh, the original five members of, I think it was five, of the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants, they had a really interesting dynamic. And you're right, they had lots of infighting because Quicksilver and the Scarlet Witch weren't evil. You know, they later left and became Avengers. Um, and they were great. Um, but they were like indebted to Magneto for saving their lives or something like that so that they worked with him and then there was the toad who Magneto was always abusing but he was fiercely loyal to him and mastermind was kind of sneaky and you know had uh, you know ideas of his own and um, they were an interesting group to say that and it was their interaction with the original five x-men that was uh, there was an interesting set of characters yeah yeah but we don't. I think that's the first time we saw that interaction. Well, yeah. I mean, usually it would be a villain with a bunch of henchmen, not villain, you know, powered underlings. Or, yeah. And he would abuse the henchmen, sure. And sometimes they would rebel, and that's about it. Yeah. That was an interesting story in some kind of book. I have no idea. But they had a school for henchmen. <laughs> I thought that was a great idea. <laughs> and one of the guys... And, the hero says, oh, I wonder where all these henchmen came from. So, <laughs> and, you know, it's a lousy job. <laughs> it's, uh, well, sure, but, I mean, if you're an ex-con or, you know, whatever, that's, that's some work, you know, like it's really hard to get, if you've got a record, it's hard to get a job. So I could yeah. see falling into the henchman yeah. career. It's a Penguin story. Um, penguin was running this factory and it's kind of shady and, and Batman looked to check it out and he had him arrested for, and they're all ex-cons in there. Yeah. But what he was, Penguin is actually trying to do is trying to go straight and help get these ex-cons a job. They can't get a job because they can't be with ex-cons. So, and so Batman then tries to save him, you know, goes to trial and loses. So, but, so. That's really interesting. So Batman was in the wrong. Right. See, that's cool because he was like, oh, the penguin and he it must be some villainy thing yeah. Um, because, yeah, now the, the dynamic what they've done with the penguin is he's legit and I'm using air quotes, yeah. um, but he's got he's almost like a crime boss now where it's he's he doesn't get his hands dirty, but he's kind of got his fingers in the underworld and he's he's a figure there. So um, and I think that's. I think that's the right way to adapt him to the to the modern age and make him useful and relevant. Um, yeah, I saw I saw a part of that in uh, Gotham is has a cataclysm and uh, oh yeah, cataclysm that was is that, that was called oh okay but, cataclysm and then no man's land and that was where they kind of reinvented the penguin like that and it was great. Oh, so that's okay. Well, I didn't know there was had any lasting effects but i'm glad to hear that and there's one shot or our panel where the penguin's saying well who do i want to lose here is you want batman or the joker to lose here <laughs> and he's trying to think of what's the best thing for him and yeah and it was just it was kind of clever and it was, yeah my that word again and i don't know just yeah what are, it's just things that i liked about yeah. it and um i the look on his face and the, and the thought and, and and it was a it was an interesting idea it was yeah. a, it was actually well and it uh, adds dimension to that character it's kind of giving complexity um, really makes any character better yeah. and they did a bane and then Batman says look you got this uh, you you're, you came here and you got this um, island and all this money so you can go there or you can stay you know. And I'll beat you up, and he, and Bane says, "Okay, I'm gone." <laughs> so, yeah, that's a great. That's, that's, that's rational. Getting that's an it. ultimatum like that, and and Bane was actually a very clever villain. He wasn't a thug. He was actually really intelligent uh, mastermind. But it was cool because he was also this powerhouse that could go toe to toe with Batman. Right. Um, it's a different cat and mouse game with that because he was he could meet him uh, on two on more than one level. Um, going back to that bit about the penguin, um, trying to decide, do I want Batman to win or the Joker? He probably said, I mean, cause I haven't read the whole thing. He probably yeah. said, I should, probably Batman because you know what you're going to get with Batman. I may be wrong. It may have been, 
It may have been Two Face, but it was like yeah. between two characters, and then the idea of was was that there was this question, and you know, I don't know, just well done. It's, you know, and so you know, it's always Sturgeon's Law, and when something is you want to uh, qualify Sturgeon's Law. Okay, um, Theodore Sturgeon was this you know, science fiction writer, and somebody says, hey, "Don't you don't you know that ninety five percent of all science fiction is crap?" And Sturgeon said. You're right, but 95% of everything is crap. And that's true. That's true. And, uh, and Theodore was Sturgeon true. was the real-life uh, inspiration for Kurt Vonnegut's character, Kilgore Trout. Vonnegut and, and, and Sturgeon were friends. So, But um, I think we've gotten down a rabbit trail, and we should probably wrap up for today. Okay. Um, this has been Comic Reflections. I'm Nicholas Prom. This is Jeff Barnhart. All right. Tune in yeah. next time. Mm-hmm.